The W.B. Yeats poem, Among School Children, has always held a fascination for me, partly because I survived the study of Yeats in secondary school and still maintained a love for his lyricism and his extraordinary ability to capture the world in a phrase. It's a testament to the precise and fabular nature of his poetry that his lines are often used as book titles, for example. Really, without going to Google, I could think of three. Slouching Towards Bethlehem by Joan Didion, No Country for Old Men by Cormac McCarthy, and Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe. And of course, popular music from Joni Mitchell to the Waterboys and Van Morrison, if they're popular anymore, is redolent with Yeats's crystalline phrases. The final four lines of Among School Children provide the architecture for what I want to set out by way of introduction to the colloquium. And they are, O chestnut tree, great rooted blossomer, are you the leaf, the blossom, or the bowl? O body swayed to music, O brightening glance, how can we know the dancer from the dance? So we work in a university where discussions about our identity have been ongoing. These discussions are often built around binaries. Should we describe ourselves as a teaching university or aspire to being a research university? As with most binaries, this restricts the argument to an either or status. I'm sure other colleagues have argued, as I will, that our unique selling point may well lie in the combination of our strengths, pedagogy, practice, research, in whatever order you want to place them. Now, I struggled for quite some time to come up with a title that might capture the intention of this event, and I emailed out suggestions to colleagues and participants, and many thanks for those who replied. Karen's response, uh, helped me focus the intention, and it became a virtuous circle, question mark, pedagogy, practice, research, explored. The question mark is literal and symbolic. I'm hoping that today will provide some further opening out of issues and debates at the heart of combining the strengths I argue are fundamental to the identity of this university. If we define a virtuous circle as a recurring cycle of events, the result of each, one being to increase the beneficial effects of the next, then today is about exploring from our range of different perspectives how this imbrication can happen. Now, this is not to set aside the difficulties we face. The question mark looms large here, but it's also to focus on the elements of virtue that underpin all we do as an institution where knowledge is shared, created, argued over and passed on. Without avoiding the problems, it is an attempt to take ownership of the discourse that sometimes pits these elements against each other and rewrite that discourse in a language that is more virtuous. In case I'm accused of Panglossian optimism about what can be achieved in today's activities, I want to stress that we will be sharing, inevitably, some of the tensions and contradictions of how these elements might work together, as well as their virtue. And I'm not suggesting it's going to prove easy. Enjoyable, I hope, but not necessarily easy. Either here, in our reflections afterwards, or in writing we might agree to do about these elements, to reference this imbrication. I'm not very interested in a grand narrative that marries the elements as some sort of menage a trois. I am interested in us exploring the tensions, the contradictions, the virtue, and the pain of the process. So how do I situate myself within this circle of elements? I was trained as a primary school teacher in the 1970s. Started teaching in 1979, and with a year's break for a master's degree in education, I have been teaching ever since. I teach, I research, but do I practice? One could argue that pedagogy is the practice of teaching. 
But when I look back on my career, I find that the practice that underpins most of my teaching and a good deal of my research is storytelling. This is not to suggest that a non-narrative approach isn't crucial to the teaching process, but let's try and put that underlying practice into operation. I should say as an aside, if I have a bit of time, that storytelling hasn't just been fundamental to my uh, practice and my research and my pedagogy. Uh, in my life, it's been crucial in the sense that, uh, unfortunately, my mum died before my two children were born, so they never got to meet her. And one of the ways in which I resurrected my mother was through storytelling. And so as we walk to school every morning, there's a gap of about two and a half years between my girls. And at one point we were walking to school together all the time. I was able to tell them stories about Granny Fox. And so Granny Fox became this uh, creation, uh, often where I was involved in being naughty. That wasn't hard as I was the youngest and the spoiled one, of course. But the girls began to build up a picture of Granny Fox through my storytelling that kept her alive. And in that sense, they still now, and we all do, have conversations about Granny Fox's baking, about Grandad Fox's work, about what I got up to and when I got into trouble, some fictional, some real. <laughs> and the girls have a sense of somebody who isn't around. And so in that way, storytelling has been crucial not just to my practice, but to my own identity and the shared identity in my family. So let's put this uh, practice into operation. I'm going to tell you the beginnings of a story. It's a mystery commonly known as a locked room mystery. I'm sure you're all familiar with them. I will offer details and try to weave a compelling beginning at least. Although the power of the story is in setting up the mystery rather than the manner of the telling. This is an exercise I use a lot with my students to encourage them to compose their own questions, their own lines of inquiry, develop their critical and creative thinking and enhance their reflective skills. Many thanks to Eddie McMillan who lent me the book from which I'm taking this particular locked room mystery and a bow towards Goran Stefanowski, who is the master of dramatic traps and hopefully will guide me along on this storytelling. It's not the right atmosphere. We need a slightly more darkened room. However, I'll give it a go. So a young woman of about 20, 21 is tending a bar in a small town in Ireland. It's a winter's night. It's about 5 to 11 and there are three drinkers in the bar. She calls time because she wants to get home. Her house is only five minutes walk away. Small town, dark country night. The bar gets closed up at 11. The lights go off. Everything seems shut up. At about half 11, her boyfriend, who's at an award ceremony in uh, the city, about 20 minutes drive away, rings up her house to speak to her thinking she'll have finished long by now, she'll be back at home. At home is her mother and another sister, about three or four years older than her. Her father is in hospital, he's had a leg operation and that's why she's been covering in the bar. She's actually a student who is doing a degree in law uh, at a university in England and she's back for the Christmas period. She's been doing a bit of part-time work in a local solicitors, but also covering in the bar. They're not that alarmed. It's only half 11, but yet it's only five minutes walk from the bar to the house. And it's a cold winter's night, small village. Most of the lights are off in the houses. They're trying to rack their brains thinking who she would have popped in to see. So they decide to walk down to the bar and sure enough, everything is locked up. Front door is locked, back door locked. All the lights are out. There are no lights in nearby houses of the people that she might want to visit. And at this stage, it's about 10 to 12 or so. And the boyfriend arrives because he's panicked, thinking, well, what's going on here? There have been a number of burglaries in the vicinity. And so they're uh, concerned enough to ring the police. 
The police come after about 15, 20 minutes. They're still looking around, trying to check inside the bar, can't see anything. When the police arrive, they knock on the doors, they try to raise uh, some sound, no sound. They shine their torches in the window. And quite near to the bar, there is the figure of what looks like a young woman lying on the ground with a stool tossed over beside her. The police break down the door, which has been locked from the inside. They all rush in. They find the young woman on the floor. It appears she's been trying to change a light bulb. There's a light bulb in her left hand. The stool has been tossed over, and she's lying beside it. They search the premises, toilets, back. All the doors are locked. There's no downstairs cellar escape point. There are windows on all of the uh, inside. The uh, windows are, all have bars on them. When the doctor arrives and examines the body, he finds a kind of conflict in the scene that's set out in front of him because he claims that the injuries sustained by the young woman couldn't have been caused by this kind of fall. He claims there must have been a heinous act, a murder. The coroner, he gives an open verdict. The young woman was agile. She was a keen horse rider. She had a great sense of balance. The idea that she might have fallen off a stool with the light bulb in her hand does seem very strange. So, if she was murdered, who did it and how did they do it? I'm not interested in you guessing because anybody who guesses leaves now, right? <laughs> what I am interested in is you chatting to the person nearest to you and coming up with a couple of questions that you would like to ask about the information that I have given, okay? So, chat with the person beside you or in a threesome and write down two questions that you want to ask about the information that I've given, okay? Yeah, Eddie, Eddie can't get involved, he knows the answer. Let's reflect on what happened. I told you a story, uh, a puzzle, in order to promote interaction, an icebreaker, if you like. I've asked you to discuss with your neighbor questions you might want to ask by way of further information that might help you understand more clearly what happened. So what, you might think? Teachers use these strategies all the time to get their audience to interact. Well, why don't we unpack that so what in order to link it to pedagogy practice research? Let's start with the research. This wasn't difficult for me. I read widely on the locked room mysteries from Murders in the Rue Morgue to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which includes a fantastic locked room mystery. I've set up an enigma, and what mystery stories share with magic tricks is once the trick is explained, you feel a bit let down. So I'm stopping you from feeling let down. <laughs> I'm being kind. The exercise is much more about what type of questions the participants ask. Now, I could unveil Bloom's taxonomy or Kolb's experiential learning cycle, and sometimes I use that with the students to give them a sense of how they might develop higher order questions. But what I think is going on here is I'm setting up a number of paradigms. The inquiry paradigm set up in this exercise takes what we might call an epistemological approach. We might ask, what is the nature of the relationship between the knower and the would-be knower and what can be known? I sound a bit like Donald Rumsfeld there. But it also begs a methodological question how can the inquirer go about finding out 
whatever he or she believes can be known. So two things going on there. In terms of the practice of storytelling, I practiced the story on my children to see if it was too obvious, too difficult, too boring. I have now put it into practice with you as a pedagogic strategy and would argue that each element of the process has been hugely beneficial to the other. Not only is this an example of a virtuous circle, it's an example in this case, as the subject is murder, of a vicious circle. And so, to return to Yeats, the words and phrases are important, but more important to me are the lines of inquiry it sets up. It asks the questions, are you the leaf, the blossom, or the bowl? And that triumvirate and how it works together is part of what I guess I want to encourage as part of what we do today. How can we know the dancer from the dance is a phrase I always use with my students when I'm talking about the intermingling of theory and practice. You cannot know one without the other. I hope our time together will generate even more questions. And with your help, and in this spirit of inquiry, I hope you will all feel you've had a stimulating day. Andy, and I must introduce Mark Hannaby. Mark will be acting as rapporteurs during the day, helping us collect our thoughts in the final plenary. And while exploring a more integrated and holistic approach that might encompass all three elements of this virtuous circle, I am reminded of Montaigne's cautionary notes in his essay on the inconstancy of our actions. We are entirely made up of bits and pieces, woven together so diversely and so shapelessly that each one of them pulls its own way at every moment. And there is as much difference between us and ourselves as there is between us and other people. So here's to a stimulating day where I hope we get to know each other and ourselves a little better. Thank you.